This material is from the information loss chapter of Biostatistics for Biomedical Research. We're going to discuss the pitfalls of categorizing uh, continuous variables and in this particular case uh, predictor variables. Uh, many researchers have gotten in the habit of categorizing variables. Uh, it's difficult to understand why uh, this has become popular, but the most likely explanation is that it simplifies some of the mathematics and makes it easy to define things such as odds ratios and hazard ratios. Uh, physicians and epidemiologists in particular uh, seem to like categorization and it's pretty easy to show that cut points in continuous variables cannot really exist and be replicable unless the underlying relationship with the outcome is discontinuous. It's also easy to show, as we will in the final following example, that even if a cut point existed, uh, it must by necessity vary with other patient characteristics. And that is because optimum decisions are based on risk. So let's consider a simple two predictor example. Uh, the problem is diagnosing pneumonia in terms of uh, triaging sick infants in developing countries. This was a study that was run by the World Health Organization in which uh, kids with um, severe medical symptoms were uh, studied uh, to understand the risk uh, of sepsis, meningitis, and pneumonia. Um, so it is never appropriate to dichotomize an input variable other than time, which we'll speak about more. And you must dichotomize only on a predicted value, if anything. There are many physicians that have said that ultimately a decision is dichotomous, and so we should dichotomize the inputs to the decision, and there is no logical connection between those two. Um, furthermore, many decisions seem to be binary but are not in fact binary because the decision may be delayed uh, to acquire more data or the decision may be made tentatively and revisited. So let's look at the World Health Organization data set and consider um, the relationship between res respiratory rate and whether the infant has a cough. Um, and the risk of pneumonia. Pneumonia here is was defined as um, four radiographers reading the same chest radiograph and all four of them uh, determining that uh, the image was consistent with pneumonia. So if we simplify the problem and only consider two predictor variables, respiratory rate adjusted for age, and whether the infant coughed or not, we're fitting the relationship between those two variables and the probability of pneumonia using a logistic regression model with a restricted cubic spline function for age and allowing the shape of the curve to be different for age for whether or not the infant had a cough. You can see from the predictions that the interaction was not really needed, uh, but we are allowing that uh, to make sure. Uh, the little tick marks uh, show the data density in the raw data. There were approximately uh, 4,500 uh, kids in the data set. So you can see that the faster the respiratory rate, uh, the higher the chances that the child will be diagnosed with pneumonia. And a child with a cough uh, is more likely to have pneumonia than a child without a cough. Now, what is a rational basis for deciding whether to admit a child to the hospital? Well, that basis has to be on the risk scale, which is the y-axis. So let's suppose that uh, depending on a certain uh, bed availability in the hospital on a given day, uh, it was decided that uh, infants with a risk of 0.3 or higher uh, were appropriate for admission to hospital. Uh, so if that's the cutoff, which we go straight across here, you can see that that would correspond to a respiratory rate of about um, 
say 66 uh, breaths per minute if the child uh, is coughing uh, and the cutoff is about 80, um, say 85 breaths per minute if the child did not cough. So it's very readily seen that for an optimum decision, um, the, the cutoff for age has to depend on whether a cough is present or not. So any um, physician who sought a cutoff for age, it, it is a futile exercise unless you want to create a cutoff for age for every combination of all the other predictive variables that the infant has. This model was greatly oversimplified because the model really needs a couple of dozen variables in it and then your cut points for age will be quite com complex but the whole exercise is unnecessary uh, because you can just uh, fit a model and then make your decision on the basis of the predicted risk. So what sort of uh, thresholds can exist uh, if any. And so in biology, the sort of thresholds that we can see uh, are the relationship shown, uh, is the relationship shown in the left panel. Let's say the x-axis is some marker or uh, measurement and the y-axis is the outcome. Uh, there are many measurements that have a sort of threshold effect where you have to exceed a certain value before the risk of the outcome starts to uh, increase. So you can see an elbow in the relationship. That's really not a discontinuity in the function. That's a discontinuity in the slope or first derivative. If you were to dichotomize this variable, um, the only possible choice would be this point. And you can see that you would be OK on the left, because this is a homogeneous group with regard to outcome. But on the right, you would be making a tremendous mistake because of extreme heterogeneity of outcome uh, in the group that's above the cut point, which is over here. Um, so the right panel shows the sort of relationship that would have to exist um, for a cut point analysis to be valid. Uh, it would have to be actually discontinuous and of course we would have to be able to know the cut point which is not always obvious. You can think in biology um, and medicine and other fields what sort of relationships are dichotomous and the only ones that come to mind are when the marker is time and this is the point at which the car went over the cliff or the CEO of a company was indicted and uh, something bad happens uh, to the company. Um, so when this is time, and what happens here is an event, an event can create a discontinuity and an outcome. Uh, but if this is not time, uh, we haven't thought of any example where this sort of relationship would really exist. So what do cut points really assume? Uh, they assume homogeneity to the right and to the left of the cut point. So almost all uh, published cut points are actually analysis artifacts. Um, and so uh, an interesting paper uh, studied this in a fairly unique way um, and st studied biomarkers in cardiology. And biomarkers, uh, cut points for biomarkers, are frequently sought by finding a, a cut point that minimizes a p-value or maximizes a t or chi-square statistic. And what uh, cut point is going to have maximum power is the median because you have equal sample size on each side of the cut point and the power of a t-test is maximum for a fixed total sample size when the two sample sizes are equal. So what this paper found uh, in looking at a marker uh, B and P is that in the published literature where uh, studies claim to find a threshold for BMP, the threshold turned out to uh, coincide almost with the sample median of BMP for patients in that particular study. So the correlation between the threshold that was claimed to be biologically uh, 
correct by the investigators and the sample median was very high. And the sample median has nothing to do with biology. It has to do with convenient sampling and uh, what sort of subjects happened to be screened and what volunteers did you get for the study. So that's, that's a non-biological uh, criteria. That's really a, more of a demographic idea. Um, and so the fact that the researchers would claim that the threshold exists and happens to be the median is nothing more than a statistical artifact. There's also a lack of meaning of effects based on cut points. We see, especially in the epidemiologic literature, uh, estimates uh, of high to low effects published. This could be high BMI versus low BMI. Um, such estimates result in inaccurate predictions, residual confounding because of heterogeneity in the subjects to the left of the cut point and to the right, and it's actually impossible to interpret. That's because the high to low ratio represents an unknown mixture of highs and lows, and the effects, such as odds ratios, will vary with the population. If the true effect is monotonic, adding subjects in the low range or the high range, or both, will increase the odds ratio. So here's an example from a paper by uh, Royston et al. where they considered the relationship between uh, serum bilirubin and uh, mortality. This is hazard ratio uh, drawn on a log scale. And the estimate of the relationship between bilirubin and the relative hazard of death uh, using continuous analyses was done three ways, assuming a linear relationship, assuming a uh, fractional polynomial or, or using uh, a spline function. And the fractional polynomial and spline function agreed to a large extent. The linear relationship is not very accurate, but it's going to be more accurate than using a cut point. And if you use a cut point, the optimum cut point was a hazard ratio of 4.2. And that 4.2 has no known definition. And if you were to add subjects with high bilirubin to the sample, that hazard ratio will go up. If you add subjects with low bilirubin to the sample, the hazard ratio will go up. So let's show that with a simple simulation. So this is simulated data uh, where uh, we have a continuous variable age, and we're fitting a Cox proportional hazards model, modeling survival time um, as a function of age. And this is assuming age is linear in the log hazard, which it happens to be by the way the data were simulated. We get a slope of 0.04. If we cut age at 50 and uh, put the model, uh, ask for the fit of the regression using this cutoff, that's just making an indicator or dummy variable. The hazard ratio for above 50 versus less than 50 was 2.1. Now, what if we took away those subjects with age greater than 60? Well, the hazard ratio for high to low age goes down to 1.6. What if we took away those subjects um, with age greater than or equal to 55? Well, the hazard ratio goes down again to 1.46. Uh, what if we took away subjects with age on the other end of extremes, age less than or equal to 40, um, the hazard ratio is 1.76, and if we only looked at subjects between 40 and 60, so we excluded the very young and the very old subjects, we are getting the lowest hazard ratio that we uh, found, uh, which is 1.35. So you can see that a high to low hazard ratio is easily manipulated by the entry criteria on the variable being studied.